Chapter 6 of The Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa S. Ware. The Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Chapter 6 American Aphorisms. 1. At the beginning of an address which Lord Morley delivered before the Edinburgh Philosophical Institute nearly thirty years ago, he told his hearers that he had often been asked for a list of the hundred best books, and that he had once been requested to supply, by return of post, the names of the three best books in the world. Both the hundred and the three are a task far too high for me he confessed, and then he declared that he would prefer to indicate what is one of the best things worth hunting for in books, the wisdom which has compacted itself into the proverb, the maxim, the aphorism, the pregnant sentence inspired by common sense in an uncommon degree. Lord Morley asserted that the essence of the aphorism is the compression of a mass of thought and observation into a single saying and he added that it ought to be neither enigmatical nor flat, neither a truism on the one hand nor a riddle on the other. The lecturer did not provide a definition of the lofty aphorism which should serve to distinguish it from the humbler proverb, and yet the distinction is perhaps contained in this last quotation, since the democratic proverb tends toward the truism, whereas the more aristocratic aphorism inclines toward the enigma. Lord John Russell once called a proverb, All men's wisdom and one man's wit. And proverbial wisdom appeals at once to the mass of mankind, whereas the less universal truth packed into the subtler aphorism is likely to demand a little time for consideration before it can win its welcome. In fact, the more keenly the maker of an aphorism has peered into the inner recesses of human nature, the less likely is his maxim to attain immediate acceptance from the multitude, who are optimistically content to see only the surface of life, and who prefer not to probe too deeply into the fundamental egotism of man. So it is that the swift apprehension of some of the shrewdest of La Rochefoucauld's sayings might almost be made to serve as a test both of the intelligence and of the knowledge of the labyrinthian intricacies of the human soul we may easily find ourselves quarreling over the veracity of an aphorism, whereas a proverb is almost indisputable. It proves itself as simply and as instantly as the assertion that two and two make four. This immediate obviousness of a proverb does not prevent it from being irreconcilable with another proverb stating the equally obvious opposite. Pennywise and Pound Foolish may seem to contradict take care of the pence, and the pounds will take care of themselves. But after all, the contradiction is only apparent. Since it needs both of these sayings to contain the whole truth, that we must be careful in the little things, no doubt, but we must also be able to discern boldly the moment when little things must be sacrificed for great things. More than one humorist has seen fit to poke fun at this peculiarity of proverbial wisdom, without any impairment of the authority of either of the contradictory assertions. The maxim we may trace to its source and tag with the name of its maker, but the proverb is not individual even if it must have been minted by some one man. Penny wise and pound foolish might have been uttered in any age, and it is only the modern expression for a rule of conduct inherited from the remotest past. An equivalent phrase must have been uttered soon after the development of articulate speech, and we may be assured that it was almost as familiar to the cave dwellers as it is to us. It did not have to be transmitted by inheritance from the dead languages to the living. It sprang into being by spontaneous generation in every tongue, ancient and modern, by the very fact that it is of universal validity and therefore of universal utility. It is to be found in every land, in every language, and in every age. The maxim, on the other hand, is more frankly individual. It is due not to the wisdom of the many but only to the penetrating wit of one, and therefore it is often racial, revealing the tongue and the time of him who first put the piercing thought into apt words. So 
it is likely to have local color, a flavor of the soil in which it grew. Some of the aphorisms of Confucius may be universal, no doubt, but others, and not a few of them, are essentially Chinese. I cannot help feeling that I discover a Roman quality in the saying of Marcus Aurelius that the best way to get revenge is to avoid being like the one who has injured you. This is not only Roman, it seems to have also an individual liberality disclosing a truly imperial mind. Many of the maxims of the caustic La Rochefoucauld are marked with the time and place of their making, the France of the aged Mazarin and the youthful Louis the Fourteenth, when the French observer asserted that you are never so easily cheated as when you are trying to cheat somebody else, he is declaring a truth which might have been uttered by Aristophanes, by Moliere, or by Mark Twain, a truth upon which are established the schemes of the green goods man and the gold brick operator of New York in the twentieth century. But when he tells us that virtue would not go far if vanity did not keep it company, there we can detect the Frenchmen of the seventeenth century. It is true that St. Beuve credits La Rochefoucauld with large imagination, not a frequent possession of the French, finding evidence for this in another of these maxims. We cannot gaze fixedly at the sun or at death. But most of these searching and scorching sentences are directly due to a disenchantment which envenoms La Rochefoucauld's scalpel, and this disenchantment was the result of a reaction of that social instinct which is a predominant French characteristic. Of course, among the mass of French aphorisms, there are a host which lack local color. When Madame de Boufflet suggested that the only perfect people are those we do not know, she was making a remark that might have been uttered by an Italian or even by a Spaniard. When the Spanish Gratian declared that the ear is the area gate of truth but the front door of lies, he was saying something that might have been said by an Englishman or by a Roman. And when Bacon asserted that extreme self-lovers will set a house on fire and it were but to roast their eggs, the wording is British, but the thought is one that might readily have occurred to a Frenchman and that might be easily paralleled in the pages of La Rochefoucauld. There is little that is significantly oriental in this specimen of the wisdom of the East. If you censure your friend for every fault he commits, there will come a time when you will have no friend to censure. A Frenchman could very well have said that, although he might have phrased it more felicitously. On the other hand, many of the sayings of Nietzsche we could not well credit to an inquisitor of any other nationality or of any other century. There are two things a true man likes, danger and play, and he likes woman because she is the most dangerous of playthings. That is one of them. And there is another. All women, behind their personal vanity, cherish an impersonal contempt for woman. And yet even in Nietzsche, we may find now and again a sentence which might have been set down on the tablets of that lonely stoic Marcus Aurelius. A slave cannot be a friend, and a tyrant cannot have a friend. 2. The perennial commonplaces of observation are reincarnated in every generation born again, century after century, in every quarter of the globe, since man himself changes only a little, even though mankind has ever the delusion of progress. It was an unknown but a most modern American who was once moved to the biting accusation against certain of his contemporary countrymen that they sought first to get on, then to get honor, and finally to get honest. Nevertheless, this bitter jibe had been anticipated by the old Greek poet Phasilides, who expressed his wish first to acquire a competence and then to practice virtue. John Fisk once wrote an essay to indicate a few of the many points of resemblance between the Athenians of old and the Americans of today. And we need not despair of yet finding a Greek wit who had already dwelt on that disadvantage of swapping horses while crossing a stream, which Lincoln once pointed out with his customary shrewdness. It is perhaps because of their superior social instinct that the French are the modern masters of the maxim 
and even if we who speak English are more abundant and more adroit in aphorism than those who speak German or those who speak Italian, we must confess our constant inferiority to those who speak French, a language that lends itself to epigram, because it has been suppled to the needs of a highly cultivated society of the nation most distinguished for its intelligence among the moderns as the Athenians were among the ancients. And of the two peoples who have English for their mother tongue, we Americans, despite our superficial and superabundant loquacity, seem to be able to achieve the sententious at least as often as the British. Lincoln was a master of the compact and pregnant phrase. So was Emerson before him, and so was Franklin a century earlier. In his autobiography, Franklin tells how he utilized the little spaces that occurred between the remarkable days in the almanac, which he issued annually for 25 years, and which was the basis of his own comfortable fortune, to contain proverbial sentences chiefly such as inculcated industry and frugality as the means of procuring wealth and thereby securing virtue, it being more difficult for a man in want to act always honestly. As to use here one of these proverbs, it is hard for an empty sack to stand upright. Most of these proverbs were borrowed from the wisdom of many ages and nations, as Franklin himself acknowledges, but not a few of them seem to be due to his own witty wisdom, and that just quoted appears to be one of these. Taken as a whole, the sayings of poor Richard range rather with the lowly proverb than with the more elevated and more incisive aphorism, and Lord Morley chose to dismiss them with curt contempt as kitchen maxims about thrift in time and money. Yet the saying about the empty sack rises a little above the level of the kitchen maxim, and so does that other which declares that, if you would have your business done, go. If not, send. One of Franklin's biographers records that when Paul Jones, after his victory in the Ranger, went to Brest to await the new ship which had been promised him, he was tormented for months by excuses and delays despite his appeals to Franklin, to the royal family, and to the king himself. Then at last, he chanced to pick up poor Richard, and the saying just quoted hit home. He took the hint, hurried to Versailles, and there got an order for the ship, which he renamed in honor of his teacher, the Bonham Richard. Emerson gives us golden nuggets of thought, so Mr. Brownell suggests, but he does not mold them into beads and link them into necklaces. His essays lack unity, except that of theme and of tone and his sentences are, as he himself confessed, infinitely repellent particles. No one of his essays is artistically composed, and almost every one of his sentences is sufficient unto itself, with a careful adroitness of composition of which he alone in his time had the secret. He is master of the winged phrase, barbed to flesh itself in the memory. In his sentence there is not only meat, but meat dressed to perfection cooked to a turn, and not lacking sauce. No writer ever possessed a more distinguished verbal instinct, or indulged it with more delight. To quote again from Mr. Brownell, Emerson fairly caresses his words and phrases, and shows in his treatment of them a pleasure nearer sensuousness, perhaps, than any other he manifests. Nonetheless, it is difficult to detach from his pages the exact maxim as we find it in Bacon and La Rochefoucauld and Vauvenargues. Emerson's thoughts are elevated and often subtle, but only rarely do they fall precisely into the form of the aphorism. He tells us that the man in the street does not know a star in the sky. But that is not quite a maxim, even if it escapes being a truism. He asserts that it is impossible for a man to be cheated by any one but himself, as for a thing to be and not to be at the same time. But that can hardly be called an aphorism, wise as it is and incisive. Perhaps the explanation lies in the fact that Emerson is wholly devoid of malice, the malice that edges La Rochefoucauld's shafts to sting themselves into our consciousness. Emerson has few delusions about the ultimate infirmities of mankind, but he is never malevolent.
he is clear-eyed beyond all question, and yet he remains optimistic. In most maxim makers, there is a spice of ill will, a taint of hostile contempt, and Emerson is ever free from ill will, from contempt, and from hostility. 3. In no department of the American branch of English literature is our benevolent optimism more pervadingly manifested than in our humor. American humor is likely to be good humor. Even our satires are not cruelly savage, and our epigrams rarely have a poisoned dart at the tail of them. Our unquenchable friendliness has prevented most native fun makers from focusing their gaze on the meaner possibilities of selfish egotism. It is not a little surprising, therefore, that the largest and most liberally endowed of our later humorists, Mark Twain, should have taken to the making of maxims as disenchanted as those of Marcus Aurelius, although not more acrid than those of La Rochefoucauld. It was toward the end of his career, when he stood pleasantly conspicuous on the pinnacle of his fame, abundantly belauded and sincerely beloved, that his indurated sadness, his total dissatisfaction with life, found relief in chiseled sentences to be set beside the sayings of Epictetus. Consider this. Whoever has lived long enough to find out what life is knows how deep a debt of gratitude we owe to Adam, the first benefactor of our race. He brought death into the world. Note how the same thought is brought forward again in this. Why is it that we rejoice at a birth and grieve at a funeral? It is because we are not the person involved. And yet another twist is given to this same thought in a third saying. All say how hard it is that we have to die. A strange complaint to come from the mouths of people who have had to live. Those who knew Mark Twain intimately were well aware of the despairing sadness that darkened his last years. He was wont to don the cap and bells to appear before the public, but in private, or at least when he was alone and lonely, he sat in sackcloth and ashes. He had always had the melancholy which is likely to underlie and to sustain robust humor, and his melancholy was even more intense and more astringent than that of Cervantes or Moliere although either of these might well have anticipated this saying of their belated brother in fun-making. The man who is a pessimist before he is forty-eight knows too much. The man who is an optimist after he is forty-eight knows too little. But it may be doubted whether either the Spaniard or the Frenchman would have penned the assertion that, if you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he will not bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and a man. Here we discover not mere pessimism, but stark misanthropy. There is a sounder philosophy in another of his sayings. Grief can take care of itself, but to get the full value of a joy, you must have someone to share it with. Quite possibly a majority of casual readers, finding these dark sayings scattered through the bright pages of a professional funny man, did not feel called upon to take them seriously, and might even have accepted them as merely humorous overstatements intended to provoke laughter by their evident exaggeration. Those casual readers may have discovered no essential difference between the annihilating blankness of the opinions just quoted and utterances avowedly caustic, such as the assertion that one of the most striking differences between a cat and a lie is that a cat only has nine lives. Yet even in this saying, the playfulness serves only to hide from the hasty the solemn warning it disguises. 4. It is the mark of the superior humorist that he arouses thought as well as laughter, and George Meredith held this to be a test of true comedy of the loftier type. Many a wise man has warned Motley that he might win a smiling welcome for his message. When Josh Billings was amusing us with his acrobatic orthography, a critic in one of the literary reviews of London was sharp enough to see that the misfit spelling was only an eccentric costume put on to compel attention, like the towering plumes of the quack doctor's hat. And this critic, by stripping off this incongruous cloak, 
borrowed by Josh Billings from Artemis Ward, removed him from the company of the mere newspaper jest manufacturers, and promoted him to the upper class of more penetrating maxim makers. Professor Bliss Perry recently remarked that the tone of many of the apothegms of Josh Billings is really grave, and that often the moralizing might be by Le Bruyere. To the Josh Billings who frankly fellowships with Artemis Ward, we may credit this paragraph. There is two things in this life for which we are never fully prepared, and that is twins, a bold whimsical absurdity which has served its purpose when it provokes the guffaw it aims to excite. But it is to the shrewd observer who is to be accompanied with La Bruyere that we must ascribe the statement here deprived of its undignified disguise of queer orthography, that when a fellow gets going downhill, it does seem as though everything had been greased for the occasion. That is an echo from Greek philosophy. And here is another saying, in which Professor Perry finds the perfect tone of the great French moralist. It is a very delicate job to forgive a man without lowering him in his own estimation, and in yours too. Perhaps it may be well to cite a third equally felicitous in its phrasing and equally acute in its content. Life is short, but it is long enough to ruin any man who wants to be ruined. These are all assertions of universal veracity, even though they lack any specific American tang. Local color is lacking also in the motto Washington Alston had painted on the wall of his studio. Selfishness in art, as in other things, is sensibility kept at home. It is absent also from Thomas Bailey Aldrett's declaration that a man is known by the company his mind keeps. And it is wanting again in John Hay's distich. There are three species of creatures who, when they seem to be coming, are going. When they seem to be going, they come. Diplomats, women, and crabs. By the side of these may be set two of Mr. E. W. Howe's country town sayings. When a man tries himself, the verdict is usually in his favor. And everyone hates a martyr. It's no wonder martyrs were burned at the stake. Yet, even in these remarks from the rural West, there is but little flavor of the soil. Perhaps this American savor can be detected a little more plainly in three of the sayings which Mr. Ken Hubbard credits to his creature, Abe Martin, and which he endows with the unpremeditated ease of the spoken word. One of them is to the effect that nobody works as hard for his money as the fellow that marries it. Another calls attention to the fact that nobody ever listened to reason on an empty stomach. And a third asserts that Folks that blurt out just what they think wouldn't be so bad if they thought. There is a homely directness about these rustic apothegms which makes them far more palatable than the strained and sophisticated epigrams of the characters of Oscar Wilde's plays who are ever striving strenuously to dazzle us with verbal pyrotechnics. The labored contortions of the London jester seem to have a thin crackle when we compare them with these examples of rustic shrewdness sprouting spontaneously on the prairies. And, in the aphorism, as in every other kind of literature, the fact is more important than the form, the content is more significant than the container. End of chapter 6 Recording by Lisa S. Ware Chapter 7 of The Tuscan of Revolt and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carla Patton. The Tuscan of Revolt and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Chapter 7 A Plea for the Platitude. Part 1. It is greatly to be regretted that we do not know the name of the man who boldly declared that 
Grover Cleveland was the greatest master of platitude since George Washington. It would be amusing to inquire whether he meant this for a compliment to Cleveland or for a reproof to Washington. It would be interesting to ask him also whether he was prepared to concede that a practical politician at the head of the commonwealth ought to be a master of platitude. If the unknown utter of this pregnant saying was willing to admit this, he would find himself in the comfortable company of that shrewd student of affairs, Walter Badgett, who held that a statesman was likely to be most useful to the community when he combined common ideas and uncommon ability. One of Cleveland's most recent successors in the presidency of the United States was accused of talking about the Ten Commandments just as if he had received them as a direct personal revelation to himself. Now there's no denying that Theodore Roosevelt was wont to talk in this fashion. And why not? As a matter of fact, the Ten Commandments had come to him as a direct personal revelation. For so they must come to every one of us who is ready to receive them and to take them to heart. In the case of Roosevelt, as in the case of Washington and Cleveland, that which was foolishly meant as a reproof turns out to be a real compliment. There can be no more imperative duty for the chief of state in a democratic republic than to reiterate the internal verities. It is his privilege also to profit by the megaphone which destiny has put at his lips to cry aloud these imperishable truths and thus to force them upon ears that might otherwise refuse to listen it may be charged that when a leader of men is insistent in inserting again and again that honesty is the best policy he is lowering himself to the inculcation of the obvious but if this is just what he believes to be needful at the moment he has no right to shrink from saying once again what many have asserted before him stephenson hit the center when he suggested that after all the commonplaces are the great poetic truths perhaps there is a small risk in declaring that we americans have a lust for novel ideas and that we listen with jaded credulity to those who get up in the marketplace to proclaim a new gospel yet we are all aware that what is new is not likely to be true and that what is true is likely to be old we all know this and yet we are often impatient with those old fogies who abide by the ancient landmarks we are prone to laugh at the mousebacks brave enough to risk the reproach brought against the cadet which has the habit of saying an undisputed thing in such a solemn way. The undisputed things are always in danger of being neglected, and they need to be said afresh to every generation in the special vocabulary of that generation and with whatever of solemnity we can command. The wisdom of the fathers must be restated for the benefit of the children and yet again for the guidance of the grandchildren just as it is certain evidence of juvenility to shriek out an accusation of plagiarism whenever two plays happen to have a casual resemblance of situation or whenever two poems chance to have a superficial identity of phrase or of cadence so it is an assured sign of immaturity to sneer at a political leader who reasserts the principles which he deems permanent and essential for the common will and to scarf at him as a dealer in platitudes and an expounder of commonplaces commonplace said lord molly in words that sound almost like an echo of stevens's after all is exactly what contains the truth which are indispensable the brief speech which Lincoln delivered at Gettysburg nearly 60 years ago is now accepted as one of the masterpieces 
of English polls, withstanding comparison with the address on a similar occasion that Thucydides put into the mouth of Pericles. It is as perfect in its lofty dignity of sentiment as it is in its lapidary concision of style, but there would be little difficulty in proving that it contains nothing new, since the thoughts that sustain it are as self-evident as they are sincere. They are the ancient thoughts which deemed to be voiced again, then and there. The stones of this sublime structure are commonplaces recognized as such long before Lincoln was born, long before Columbus set sail on the Western Ocean. These well-worn blocks Lincoln chose for his own use with his unerring tact, and he submitted them together once again by his own personality. Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, is a mosaic of sentiments and of opinions familiar to every one of us from our youth up, and already phased in all sorts of fashion in every tongue, living or dead. Nevertheless, that monologue, compounded as it may be of commonplaces, bereft of all novelty, glows and burns with the inner fire of Hamlet's soul at that awful crisis of his fate. It propounds once and for all the mighty questions we cannot help putting to ourselves when we also find ourselves in the valley of the shadow. And when the time comes for any one of us to face those questions, we shall not cavil at their iniquity, for then they will erect themselves in front of us with a newborn challenge. Part 2 It may be acknowledged, frankly, that the Gettysburg speech and Hamlet's soliloquy are extreme cases. The savor of a stimulating individuality is likely to be lacking from compositions as fundamentally unoriginal as these two are seen to be when they are reduced to their elements. A commonplace is effective and therefore not merely to be pardoned, but even to be praised. Only when it is a personal rediscovery of the speaker, when he unhesitatingly believes himself to be speaking out of the fullness of his own feeling. At the moment, he may not know, and he surely does not care, whether or not the things he is called upon to speak have ever been uttered before. And he is well aware that this does not matter at all, since these things have come to him fresh from his own experience, hot from his own heart. Then the platitude is redeemed and transfigured by poignant personality, as when the fabled Scotsman has verted earnestly that honesty is the best policy, adding by way of explanation, I hate tribate. What could be more commonplace? Then honesty is the best policy. It is the tritus of truism, but it came to the mouth of that man from the depth of his own soul. He had no doubt but that he was lighting a torch for the feet of those who wandered in the darkness. Deprived commonplace of this note of rediscovery by which the old is made new of its own accord, and it is the abomination of desolation. A sequence of platitudes peddled from a platform of an uninspired speaker who refuses to rely on his actual feelings, who never had an idea of his own, and who is seeking to say only what nobody will dispute. This cannot fail to be stale, flat, and unprofitable. Even if every single commonplace of which it is compacted may contain an imitable truth. It is the prevalence of speech-making of this sort, so threadbare and so colorless, that it seems insincere, which revolts those who demand that a man shall reveal some evidence either of emotion or of celebration before they will listen to him. This attitude is natural enough, 
but it brings with it a double danger. First of all, it tempts us to disregard the truth, which may be clothed in the most offensively insipid commonplace. And second, it allures us into the primrose path of paradox. The commonplace is not always to be accepted at its face value. It may not be true now, whatever it has been once upon a time, and it may even never have been true, but only plausible and specious. There is no virtue in the commonplace itself, and there may be vice in it. Its value resides wholly in the truth which it may contain and which each of us must appraise for himself. But as the truth is not necessarily inherent in a platitude, neither is it necessarily inherent in a paradox. Even Mr. Shaw and Mr. Chesterton, if pushed to the wall, would probably be willing to admit that there are some paradoxes which are not true. They might be ready even to accept the definition of a paradox as a truth serving its apprenticeship. That is what a paradox may be, no doubt. It may be a peremptory challenge to the commonplace which has ceased to sheath the verity. Even if it has not yet worn out its welcome, the paradox of this quality, however, is not really a paradox. It is only a pseudo-paradox. It is a new shape of truth. And by that very fact, it is condemned to become a commonplace in its turn, whenever it shall have ousted the platitude it is attacking. This pseudo-paradox, which sooner or later will inevitably issue from unthinking lips as an impregnable platitude, is never merely a commonplace reversed. To turn a truth upside down is not to turn it inside out. To stand a truism on its head is profitless. And there is no stimulus to clear thought in a glib suggestion that dishonesty is the best policy or that procrastination is the guardian of time. And in fullacy, a phrase making like this may have an erivescent glitter yet it is but the flickering of thorns under a pot it may amuse babes and sucklings for a little season to be told that the devil is not as black as he is painted since he possesses at least the christian virtue of perseverance verbal fireworks are attractive only to the very young the writer whose pages coruscate with unexpected inversions of accepted beliefs and who exhibits himself as a Catherine Will of multicolored paradox is likely sooner to sputter out in the darkness and in silence. If Mr. Bernard Shaw has any abiding value as a stimulated thinker, this is in spite of his flamboyant method of expressing himself and not because of it. A French critic has asserted that men may be grouped into three classes, so far as their attitude towards the truth is concerned. First of all, there is an immense majority assured that the wisdom of the past will be the wisdom of the future, and glad always to hear again the accepted commonplace. Second, there is the youthful minority, weary of these traditional statements and avidly relishing any paradox which seems to pierce the crust of convention. Third, there is the little knot of those who are in the habit of doing their own thinking and who are ever ready to receive a novel idea on probation, to weigh it cautiously and to test it thoroughly with the willingness to accept it ultimately and to make it their own thereafter, if it approves itself. It is from these small companies that new ideas come into being and get into circulation the members of this third group have to be won over before any novelty has a valid chance of acceptance and when at last they have been taken captive the members of the first group will slowly very slowly 
and after violent opposition follow in their wake the chosen few carry the flag to the front and trailing after them comes the immense majority which gives solidarity to the body politic changing its mind only by almost imperceptible degrees and the second group the youthful minority with its delight in disinterrogating paradox is almost negligible because it lacks intellectual sincerity its puerile protest against the platitudes which buttress the social organization merely irritate the immense majority while they evoke only tolerant contempt for wiser men the youthful minority is puffed up with pride at its discovery that elementary truths are commonplace but bread and beef are the commonplaces of diet none the less wholesome and indeed none the less welcome because they lack the spice of novelty man cannot live by paradox alone if the staff of life chances to be contained in any paradox then this is not a true paradox and then also it is on the way in its turn to become a platitude it was Bellieu who remarked that a new thought is a thought which must have come to many but which some one happens first to express and this is perhaps the source of popes what oft was thought but near so well expressed if we insist on escaping from the fenced fields of the commonplace we cannot complain if we find ourselves landing in the thorny hedge of freakish unreason end of chapter chapter eight of the toscan of revolt and other essays this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carla Patton. The Toscan of Revolt and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Chapter 8 The Length of Cleopatra's Nose. Part 1 one of the best known and most frequently quoted of the thoughts of pascal calls attention to the way in which a little thing may have great consequences he who wants to fully understand the vanity of man has only to consider the causes and the effects of love the cause is i know not what and the consequences of it are frightful this i know not what so trivial that it can scarcely be recognized moves all mankind kings and armies and the entire social organization the nose of cleopatra if it had been shorter the history of the world would have been changed although cleopatra was the serpent of the old nile she was not an egyptian but a greek she was a hyphenated queen which is what queens usually are. Even if Mahaffey was right in holding that the Greeks were not really as superior to us in physical beauty as the surviving statues might lead us to believe, she may have had more than her share of good looks, which must have been not uncommon among the Hellenic people as she was a greek she probably did not have a roman nose indeed her nose may have been tilt tilted like the petal of a flower which would not have diminished her fascination but whatever the shape or the length of her nose pascal is justified in believing that if it had been unduly short she would probably not have descended the corridors of time as the heroine of the most disastrous of historic love stories she might then have floated down the river in her glittering barge without finding mark antony at her feet when she stepped ashore if mark antony had escaped 
the corals of the Egyptian serpent, he might not have lost the battle at Actium. And if he had vanquished the young Octavius, Mark Antony might have been the founder of the Roman Empire. But Mark Antony was unfit for the appalling task of solidifying a realm on the verge of wreck. He was too impetuous and too fickle, too emotional and too uncertain. He lacked the self-restraint, the caution, and the astute statecraft of the Augustus, who laid solid the foundations of Rome's imperial grandeur. Even if Mark Antony had made himself master of the Mediterranean lands, and if he had ruled as long as he lived, it is unlikely that he would have governed wisely. And after his death, chaos would have come again. The empire would not have been skillfully bustrous, and its outlaying territories would not have been unified with Rome and grateful for the three centuries of assured prosperity which followed the advent of augustus when the time was fulfilled the gates of the empire would not have been guarded and the barbarians would have broken in there would have followed swift disintegration and destruction and there would have been no lingering decline and no long deferred fall for gibson to chronicle and to illuminate then we moderns would not have come into the heritage upon which our civilization is based it is very lucky for us today that the nose of cleopatra was of normal length and that the frightful consequences of its possible abbreviation were avoided if it had been shorter it would have changed not only her face but the face of the world in this twentieth century yet i may venture to hint a doubt whether cleopatra's nose or cleopatra herself had really the immense importance that pascal asserted it is true that the captivating queen of egypt was antony's evil genius and that she was responsible for his ignominious defeat but if we look a little longer and a little deeper we are likely to conclude that antony's fatal weakness was in himself in his unstable character in his lawless and lustful temperament if he had never laid eyes on cleopatra the ultimate result might well have been the same she was not the only charmer of her time even if she might be the most dangerous there were others and any one of them could have lured the unstable roman to his allotted doom more than one later writer has applied pascal's thoughts to other historical events among them was eugene scribe most adroit of playwrights even if he was devoid of the ample vision of the more richly endowed dramatist one of his most ambitious and most ingenious comedies is a glass of water are great effects from little causes it dealt not with queen cleopatra of egypt but with queen anne of england and it aroused the heir of Thackeray, who was in paris when it was originally presented in eighteen forty Thackeray was then only a hard-working journalist contributing to the heterogeny of magazines he took this play of scribes as the text for a paper on english history and character on the french stage he expressed his disapproval of scribes assumption that the historical trophies of england are generally the result of some mean accident which entirely strips them of their ideal glory after analyzing the french piece the english critic asserted that scribe was wrong in his general principle since trivial consequences are in this life pretexts not causes for breach of long established connections they are the readily available facts which discover the depth of an existing difference they are the seized to decide an already impending rapture in other words 
the little things which sometimes seem so significant is only what the physicians call an exciting cause always far less important than what they term a predisposing condition the last straw does not break the camel's back unless that patient beast is already laden to the limit of endurance the slight pressure on the hair trigger which fires the gun does not load the weapon or aim it part two but even if little things are unlikely to have great consequences there are often remote causes not immediately apparent to those who contemplate their ultimate results i remember a whimsical suggestion in a book by one of darwin's disciples although i cannot now recapture the title of the volume or the name of its author to the effect that the sturdy staunchness of the british army the stubborn resistance of the thin red line was due to the prevalence of spinsterhood in great britain to the fact that the women outnumbered the men the explanation of this paradox is to be found in a sequence of causes and consequences the british soldier is nourished on beef and the quality of the beef is due to the abundance of clover which needs to be fertilized by bees but bees cannot multiply and live unless they are protected against the field mice which destroy their broods and ravage their reserves of honey the field mouse can be kept down if there are only cats enough to catch them and cats are the favorites of the frequent old maids of england these lonely virgins keep pets who prevent the mice from despoiling and destroying the bees so clover flourishes luxuriantly and the cattle wax fat to supply the soldiers of the king with their strengthening rations for another illustration of a remote cause having a most unexpected consequence i am able to give chapter and verse in sir martin conway's brilliant discussion of the domain of art he tells us that the beautiful costumes of the cavaliers of england as we see them in van dyck's portraits owe their chief embellishment to the hardy mariners who ventured into the stormy waters near spitzbergen an interesting example of the reaction of invention or discovery upon one of the arts of life came recently under my observation and is perhaps worth a brief digression to record in the process of conducting in the public office researches into the history of spitzbergen and of the english and dutch welling industries on its coast i was struck by the numerous documents relating to soap that i kept encountering on looking more closely into the matter it presently appeared that the chief use to which well oil was put was the manufacture of the better class of soaps such as was used in fine laundry work carmina old-fashioned soaps being made out of rapeseed when it is bore in mind that before the beginning of the english well fishery on the spitzbergen coast about sixteen ten there was practically no well all brought into england the relative dearth of good soap in tridor days may be deduced improved laundry work followed the well fishery hence the relative small rips that we see in tridor portraits and the small amounts of linen displayed jacob bean portraits show more linen and lace portraits of the time of charles are yet more as i transcribe this passage due to sir martin's researches into the history of art and to his own exploration of spitzbergen i am reminded of a chat that i had one rainy afternoon a score of years ago in the spacious smoking-room built on the roof of the antheum in london in the course of our wandering conversation we happened to touch on this topic the unknown origin of things well known are you aware he asked with a smile that the outflowering of tridor architecture which is one of the glories of england must be ascribed to the cultivation of the turnip by the dutch i smiled in my turn 
and admitted my ignorance of this fact. But I can tell you, I added, how it is that Nelson's victory at Trafalgar brought about the popularity of British jams and marmalades in the United States. Are you aware of that? No, he answered. Let us expound our riddles to each other. I besought him to begin the exposition. Well, he said, England has a damp climate, as you may have noticed, and that makes it the best grazing country in the world, especially for sheep. But until the culture of root crops was developed in Holland and transplanted to England, our farmers found it almost impossible to carry their sheep through the winter. This was made easy for them by the introduction of the turnip, whereupon there was an immediate increase in sheep raising, which ultimately gave England the immensely profitable wool trade and the enriched Tridor merchants, like true Englishmen, spent their gains freely on their houses. Now for Trafalgar and Marmalade. Well, I said, Nelson's defeat of the French and Spanish fleets gave England thereafter the undisputed command of the sea and cut the continent off from the colonies. The chief of the earlier importations from tropical countries had been sugar and the deprivation of this was so keenly felt that napoleon offered a tempting reward for a method of making sugar independent of sugar cane this was the origin of the beet sugar industry which had at first to be fostered by bounties from the government after waterloo half the countries of the continent found themselves with thousands of acres of beet fields which would go out of cultivation if sugar cane should be allowed to compete. To protect the farmers, some countries, including Germany, put a high tariff on sugar cane and paid an export bounty on beet sugar. As England was soon to be a free trade country, this German bounty fed beet sugar was in time dumped on the London market it ruined the sugar planters of jamaica and barbados but it gave the british makers of preserves their chief raw material at a price which enabled them to import oranges from spain to dundee and even strawberries from france to london and then to export wholesale to the united states their marmalades and jams i see said conway and now i'd like to ask you whether you have ever traced the defeat of the armada to martin luther no then i will enlighten you as to that when henry the eighth broke with the pope he followed luther's example and did away with the frequent fast days this was a sad blow to the fisher folk but they regained a temporary prosperity under mary only to lose it again under elizabeth so it was that the experienced crews of the fishing fleet were glad to volunteer to repel the naval attack of the spanish sovereign and they supplied a indisputable element to the flying squadrons of the british admirals then it was my turn to put another question i'd like to ask whether you have ever considered the influence of the gulf stream on the field sports of england cricket and lawn tennis and football if these sports are indulged in by multitude of young men and maidens part of the credit must go to the ample current of warm water which flows incessantly across the atlantic in an invisible channel of its own as the british isles are as far north as is labrador on our side of the western ocean they would be as desolate and as sparsely peopled as labrador were it not for the softening effect of the gulf stream because it is nearer the arctic england has a longer day than france or the united states and therefore the young men and maidens can do a day's work and still have two or three hours of daylight in which to play outdoor games so you british had best be aware for if we americans are ever aroused to wrath and if we succeed in diverting the gulf stream 
then great britain will speedily descend to the sad condition of a sparsely inhabited island part three the gentle reader is now in possession of the principles and the processes of a novel sport and he can hunt down strange unsuspected and remote causes whenever he is sleepless at night or bookless on a train the game can be played by any one all by his lone as a solitaire or a half dozen may take part sitting in a cosy semicircle about the fire while the winter winds whirls the dry snow against the frosted windows you may seek out the ulterior propulsion responsible for the arrival of an event which may be local or national or even international since no man's eye can follow the ever widening circle that any word or deed may set in motion here are three sample inquiries likely to be puzzling to novice at the sport the first is very easy explain how it is that the dykes of holland were responsible for the prevalence of high stoop residents in chicago the second is not quite so simple show how it is that the invention of the cotton gin by eli whitney was a dominating factor in the adoption by the united states of a constitutional amendment prohibiting the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquors and the third takes a wider range and demands a ramble over three continents how was it that cleveland's election was one of the reasons why the foreign legion in peking had to withstand the attack of the so-called black flags during the boxer rebellion by the aid of the dykes the dutch reclaimed a large part of their land from the sea a reclamation which required a system of canals to catch the surface water in a flat country having an intricate network of canals it is impossible to excavate dry cellars under the dwellings so the dutch raised the first floor of their houses that they might construct cellars above water level and this forced them to put a flight of outside steps before the front door when the sons of holland settled on manhattan island and founded new amsterdam they cut a canal into what is now broad street and in their house building they followed the fashion of their native land from new york the high stoop was borrowed by many cities in the west although these towns had dry land for their cellars and although the high stoop is not an architectural device of inherent attractiveness at the end of the eighteenth century slavery was slowly disappearing in the united states it had been abandoned in most of the northern states and in the south washington and jefferson expected its early extinction but whitney invented the cotton gin and there followed an immediate increase in the acreage in which cotton was under cultivation the southern planters decided that they could not do without slave labor and the negro was emancipated only as an incident of the civil war after the reconstruction period the black race multiplied and on the weaker members of the race liquor exerted a dangerous influence to remove the temptation with its baleful possibilities the white men of the south many of whom were not themselves abstemious voted for prohibition without the support of the solid south the constitutional amendment would have failed of ratification in cleveland's second term he sent to congress his venezuelan message which was a notification to all the world that the united states would not allow any european nation to enlarge the bounties of its possessions in south america a notification fatal to the intention of the german emperor to acquire more or less of brazil forced to look elsewhere the kaiser took advantage of the killing of several german missionaries to seize kouchu a seizure which infuriated the chinese and which moved them to the boxer rebellion culminating in an attack on the foreigners in peking part four
Perhaps this parlor game of unforeseen consequences may appear to the gentle reader not a little childish, and I may as well confess at once that it has been anticipated by one of the most primitive of nursery tales, what which explains to us the manifold reason why the old woman could not get home. Because the cat wouldn't eat the rat. Because the rat wouldn't gnaw the rope. Because the rope wouldn't hang the butcher. Because the butcher wouldn't kill the calf. Because the calf wouldn't drink the water. Because the water wouldn't quench the fire. Because the fire wouldn't burn the stick. Because the stick wouldn't beat the dog. Because the dog wouldn't bite the pig. And because the pig wouldn't go over the stall. But it is not so parole a sport as it may seem. If we keep in mind always the necessary distinction between the exciting cause, which may be only a triviality, and the predisposing condition, which is always the dominant factor, what Austin Dobson called the little great, the infinite small thing that ruled the hour when Louis Comte was king, maybe no more than the last ounce that weighs down the scales of destiny on one side or the other there is truth also in the same poet's assertion that the fan in the delicate fingers of madame de pompadour may have given the signal which resulted in the ruin of a realm ah but things more than polite hang on this toy vis-a-vis matters of state and of might things that great ministers do things that may be overthrew those in whose brains they began here was the sign and the clue this was the pompadour's fan yet it was not the flutter of the french fan which brought about the war of the austrian secession it was the selfishness of a german king as devoid of scruple as he was free from hypocrisy macaulay tells us that frederick's own words were that ambition interest the desire of making people talk about me carried the day and i decided for war and macaulay passed the verdict of history not to be reopened even by the eloquent special pleading of carlyle on the head of frederick is all the blood which was shed in a war that raged during many years and in every quarter of the globe the blood of the columns of fortinoy the blood of the mountaineers who were slaughtered at culloden in order that he might rob a neighbor whom he had promised to defend black men fought on the coast of Cormandel, and red men scalped each other by the great lakes of North America. End of chapter. Chapter 9 of The Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scotty Smith. The Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Chapter 9 Concerning Conversation 1. It is not always that foreigners adrift for a few weeks in these United States exhibit that condescension which Lowell resented sharply. Sometimes they reveal themselves as very frank in expressing their disappointment and their disapproval. It cannot be denied that they are often disappointed in us, perhaps almost as often as we are disappointed in them. They may have ventured across the western ocean merely to spy out the land, or they may have arrived as missionaries of culture, having prepared themselves to enlighten us by means of lectures in words of one syllable, to borrow a pertinent phrase of Colonel Higginson's. But whether they come as single spies or in lecturing battalions, they rarely display the self-control which prevented Thackeray from adverse criticism of his quondam hosts. Dickens had been welcomed as a guest of the nation, but he did not hold that the acceptance of our hospitality debarred him from the privilege of speaking his mind freely about his entertainers. 
many lesser men have shared our bread and salt and not a few of them have felt free to follow the example of dickens rather than that of thackeray in the fall of 1909, a wandering British philosopher who hailed from the University of Cambridge was a guest at various American colleges, and after he had gone back to his own place, he published in a Cambridge Review his opinion that, in America there is, broadly speaking, no culture. There is instruction, there is research, there is technical and professional training, there is specialization in science and in industry there is every possible application of life to purposes and ends but there is no life for its own sake and he declared that you will find if you travel long in america that you are suffering from a kind of atrophy you will not at first realize what it means but suddenly it will flash upon you that you are suffering from lack of conversation you do not converse you cannot you can only talk it is the rarest thing to meet a man who, when a subject is started, is willing or able to follow it out into its ramifications, to play with it, to embroider it with pathos or with wit, to penetrate to its roots, to trace its connections and affinities. Question and answer, anecdote and jest are the staple of American conversation, and, above all, information. They have a hunger for positive facts." In a sweeping assertion like this, there is certainly no hint of condescension, even if there is in it a disquieting assumption of superiority. That it should have been made by an Englishman is a little startling, since our kin across the sea would seem to be related to us in nothing more intimately than in their desire for information and their hunger for positive facts. It would have been more understandable if this assertion had been risked by a Frenchman, since the French are governed by the social instinct, and trained from their youth to be easy in converse themselves, and also to put others at their ease. There it is, however, made by an Englishman. And this leaves us wondering what Hawthorne could have meant when he made one of the entries in the notebook he kept while he was in exile as consul to Liverpool. "'I wish I could know exactly what the English style good conversation.' Perhaps it is something like plum pudding, as heavy, but seldom as rich. 2. Yet there is profit always in weighing the words of an alien critic of American characteristics, and in trying to discover how much of truth may be contained in his off-hand opinion. We can afford to overlook the casual discourtesy of his supercilious and superficial phrase if we are able to get at the core of his accusation. It is well that we should know ourselves, and we cannot deny our gratitude to the foreigner who forces us to take stock of our deficiencies. If we are frank, we must admit that question and answer, antidote and jest, are frequent in our mouths, and that our ears hunger for information. The relish for antidote and jest is one manifestation of that omnipresent American humor, which is also good humor, and which may often degenerate into mere triviality. The desire for positive facts is an attribute of our practicality, of our ability to turn everything to account. We are not unlike the Athenians of old, in our eagerness to hear and to tell some new thing. And probably some part of the widespread ability to shift our ingenuity suddenly into new channels may be ascribed to this very characteristic. A chance fact dropped in a talk by a stranger, a casual scrap of information picked up by the wayside. These things may have been the seed corn of many a new industry. We have no cause to blush when we are told that we have a hunger for positive facts, or even when we are assured that the staple of our talk is question and answer. This is as it should be, and no man has a right to expect anything more in ordinary talk. But the imported lecturer made a sharp distinction between ordinary talk and genuine conversation. Talk is all in a day's work. It is practical. It consists of question and answer. It lends itself lightly to the interchange of facts and to the swapping of stories. Conversation is another thing altogether, or rather, it is the same thing elevated and glorified.' 
there is the same difference between talk and conversation that there is between house painting and the mural decoration of Pouvy de Chauvin or of John Lafarge. Talk might be called one of the mechanical arts, whereas conversation is one of the fine arts. Only a man born to the craft, specifically gifted for it, trained by years of practice, enlightened by the example of the masters of conversation, can take a subject, follow it out in all its ramifications, play with it, embroider it with pathos or with wit, penetrate to its roots, and trace its connections and affinities. A great converser is like any other great artist, born, not made, or rather, born and also made. Our Cambridge critic has here supplied an admirable definition of the fine art of conversation as distinguished from the frankly inartistic talk of everyday life. Where he made his slip was in expecting to find practitioners of this delicate art scattered all over the United States wherever his engagements might take him in no country of the world is any one of the fine arts cultivated by the average man and it is absurd to expect the average man to lift himself to this exalted level of artistic accomplishment the average man has no time for any of the fine arts he's too busy trying to keep a roof over his head and to make a living for his family the masters of conversation are no more frequent in america than they are anywhere else and the visitor from abroad is no more likely to drop into the center of a circle of these artists here than an American abroad is likely to happen into a similar group on the other side. In no country do these artists in conversation hold an open exhibition and sell tickets at the door. Hawthorne, for example, before he went to England, had attended the Saturday luncheons at Boston, with Lowell at one end of the table and Holmes at the other and it is small wonder that he failed to find conversation of that kind in Liverpool. The itinerant lecturer who recorded his sufferings from a lack of conversation here in the United States did not have the good fortune to penetrate into the circles where that fine art is cultivated. At home he knew where to go and get just what he wanted, and because he did not know where to get it here, he was rash enough to deny that it existed. The blunder may have been natural enough, but it was a blunder nevertheless, and it was intensified by his failure to reflect on the fact that he was not one of us, but an outsider, a man not tested, an unknown quantity passing through hastily and only pausing here and there to eat and sleep, and to speak his peace and then away even if he had by chance found himself in a circle of true lovers of conversation he himself would have been a disturbing element and he might have departed without ever suspecting that he had been in the company of the very artists whose society he was vainly seeking a master of conversation might shrink from showing off before a stranger he might prefer to reserve for his intimates the full display of his powers Three. Our British visitor failed to find fit conversation here in America, yet he seems to have had no doubt that it existed in England. But a recent American writer is saddened because it cannot now be found anywhere. He has asserted that present-day conversation has sunk far below the high levels of the talk of the past, that our conversational performances are flat, thin, and poor, and that conversation is indeed a lost art. He believed that this assertion would pass unchallenged, and he set it in the foreground of a welcome volume into which he collected half a score of essays on the subject. He even ventured to entitle this agreeable gathering The Lost Art of Conversation. Here again we find cropping up the ineradicable belief that this is a day of decadence and that there were giants in other days to whose stature we cannot hope to stretch ourselves we are all prone to be praisers of past times especially when we are very young or very old the great masters are all dead and we have been born too late into an exhausted world there are no great actors now and no great orators and no great conversationalists Yet this belief is the result of an optical illusion, like that which leads us to think the telegraph poles are closer together the farther off they are. As a matter of fact, 
good conversation is probably no rarer today in these united states than it ever was anywhere it must always be rare if conversation is truly one of the fine arts it flourished in london in the eighteenth century in the club which gathered about johnson although his selfish brutality must have often killed the easy interchange of questions and answer since johnson was incorrigibly domineering and as goldsmith said whenever his pistol missed fire he knocked you down with the butt conversation flourishes to-day in new york in several little circles where there are men of the world and men of affairs who are able to follow a subject out to its ramifications and to play with it penetrating to its roots and embroidering it with wit and with pathos such little circles are not many of course but they exist here and now known to those who are competent to join them and necessarily unknown to the rest of the world in the illuminating collection of essays on the lost art of conversation i find the two characteristically acute papers of robert louis stevenson on talk and talkers stevenson was a delightful talker himself as i can testify although i had only the privilege of one afternoon's session with him not long before he left england for the last time in these essays he painted the portraits of six of his friends whom he held to be masters of the art of conversation these friends whose powers he was celebrating he disguised under various names burley springheeled jack cockshot and purcell most of them are now dead and there is no indiscretion in giving their real names cockshot was professor fleming jenkin whose biography stevenson was to write burley was his collaborator w e henley who turned traitor after stevenson's death springheeled jack was his cousin r a m stevenson athelred was i believe his executor mr baxter opalstein was john addington simmons and purcell was mr edmund goss it was my good fortune in the early eighties of the last century to make the acquaintance of four of the six i never had the pleasure of talking with simmons or with mr baxter and i think i had speech with r a m stevenson only two or three times but the other three i met frequently often together although they were not as intimate with each other severally as they were with stevenson himself that they were masters of the art of conversation conscious and deliberate artists this is beyond all question fleming jenkin more especially was one of the most gifted and spontaneous talkers i have ever had the delight of listening to full of whim and wisdom delighting in expounding theories tinctured with his own sparkling originality yet i should hesitate to assign to any one of these four british subjects a higher place in the hierarchy of good talkers than i should bestow upon four american citizens thomas b reed and john hay clarence king and thomas bailey aldrich they were all wits but they none of them insisted on reducing talk to a soliloquy as macaulay and gladstone were wont to do a brilliant conversationalist cannot be a monologue artist he must give and take he must play the game fairly allowing his associates a chance to show what they can do also on the other hand wit is the most precious ingredient of good talk and no lover of high converse will hold with prior's man who thinks wit the bane of conversation and says that learning spoils a nation tom reed's conversation was a constant delight due in part to his caustic wit john hay had the same wide knowledge of men and affairs and his talk was also flavored with a subacid wit clarence king had an equally large acquaintance with the world and an equally frank delivery in his opinion about men and things and as for aldrich pearls of wit dropped from his lips whenever he opened his mouth i chanced to say to him once that it was curious how a certain british scholar who seemed to have read everything and written about everything should not have gained greater wisdom by all his labors yes said aldrich he is like a gas pipe no richer for the illumination it has conveyed four of course 
this specimen brick is wholly inadequate even to suggest an idea of the house of conversation in which reed and hay aldrich and king made themselves at home good talk is not merely a swift succession of good things and after a while a sequence of smart sayings will prove fatiguing the subject must be embroidered with pathos as well as with wit and it must be penetrated to its roots and explored in the affinities as a british lecturer asserted good talk calls for the clash of opinions and for the shock of prejudices contradiction the courteous contradiction of an equal who has self-respect so abundant that he respects also the views of his opponent contradiction is of the essence of the contract there never was a more foolish definition than that which declared an agreeable man to be a man who agrees with you so far as conversation is concerned an agreeable man is one who disagrees with you courteously but insistently who assaults your private opinions and who takes your pet prejudices by storm for really good talk you need the man who can see both sides of a question and who can suddenly discover a third side disconcerting to both parties he may be a feeble arithmetician who tries to make two half-truths equal to a whole truth and yet even this may be risked in conversation sprung upon the hearers unexpectedly to force them to go back to first principles it seemed fairest to match stevenson's quartet of british conversers with the four americans now departed and therefore to be named here without impropriety in my own generation i should be at no loss to single out at least half a dozen masters of the art of conversation not unworthy of comparison with those whom i have already called to the witness stand two or three of my colleagues at columbia university could not be omitted from any catalogue of competent conversers they are scholars who have not allowed their wide knowledge to weigh down their wit and who are free from the reproach that vauvenargh brought against the men of learning who resemble gross feeders with a bad digestion equally insistent upon admission to the list of good talkers i happen to know are two artists one a mural painter and the other an illustrator whose conversation has the ring of the true metal both of them have what stevenson credited to henley a desire to hear although not always to listen although both of them may succumb on occasion to the temptation to monologue they can be tempted into team play serving an idea like a tennis ball with long rallies during which the subject flies high and is returned sharply and seems about to fall to the ground only to be caught up dexterously and driven into an unexpected corner the reason why conversation of the highest type is infrequent is that its substance must be ideas rather than things or persons now the immense majority of mankind seem to be interested if not solely at least chiefly in persons nothing human is foreign to them and they take a keen relish in discussing their fellow creatures yet the bulk of this talk is about individuals known to the talkers themselves and conversation of the majority rarely aspires to deal with humanity at large with men and women in their ampler relations for the most part this talk is merely gossip the interchange of question and answer about friends and acquaintances a comfortable minority may like to converse about things and to exchange information it is this minority which exhibits that hunger for facts which our british visitor noted comparatively few are those who can lift themselves up to the level of general ideas and who can tunnel down to the principles which govern human conduct yet conversation displays itself to best advantage only when the participants are willing to deal with ideas rather than with persons and things although without neglecting these not only must they be willing to do this they must also be capable of it they need a broad basis of knowledge as well as a shrewd understanding of human nature and of the interplay of the social forces when the requirements and conditions of genuine conversation are clearly comprehended we need not be surprised that it is a rarity today and that it always has been a rarity and we can appreciate the full meaning of holmes assertion in the autocrat of the breakfast-table that 
talking is one of the fine arts the noblest the most important the most difficult and its fluent harmonies may be spoiled by the intrusion of a single harsh note nineteen ten end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of *The Toxin of Revolt* and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. *The Toxin of Revolt* and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Chapter Ten: The Gentle Art of Repartee. One dr holmes once declared that the bound volumes of comic papers were the cemeteries of hilarity interspersed with cenotaphs of wit and humor probably he would have admitted that only the cypress and the yew could supply appropriate shelving for the second-rate comic plays of the immediate past brisk enough in the performance not so very long ago and yet sadly old-fashioned now that our taste in jokes has changed still a wise word or a witty way may be gleaned even from these forlorn pieces which we may dismiss with what the colored gentlemen aptly call despisery in a forgotten english comedy of the second half of the nineteenth century a man describing the only kind of woman he would be willing to marry asserted that she must be a clever woman a very clever woman a woman clever enough to begin a conversation with a repartee this is evidence that bachelors are ever unreasonable in the demands they make upon spinsters, since there never was a woman clever enough to open a conversation with a retort. Any dictionary will remind us that a mere smart saying, a glittering epigram, a brilliant witticism, is not entitled to be received as a repartee unless it is a rejoinder. The exact definition of repartee is a clever, ready, and witty retort. In one of the leather stocking tales, Cooper narrates that Natty Bumpo was engaged in single combat with an adroit Indian foe, and that the redskin finally cast his tomahawk at the white hunter. Leather stocking swiftly stepped aside and with inconceivable dexterity caught the glittering weapon as it flew through the air, and with unerring aim hurled it back to sink into the brain of his supple enemy. That was a true repartee the rejoinder of the backwoods the retort in kind which closes a conversation and renders all further discussion unnecessary it is therefore quite different from leather stockings marvelous feats of marksmanship when he drew a bead on a distant foe and dropped him in his tracks before the enemy knew what had hit him if we accept this distinction as i think we must we are forced to rule out a host of unexpected witticisms spontaneously generated and yet devoid of this element of rejoinder they may be as rapid and as recreative as the true repartee but they lack this necessary element of self-defense of legitimate reprisal congreve once told collie kibber that there were many witty speeches in one of kibber's comedies and also many speeches that looked witty and yet were not really what they seemed at first sight so there are delightfully sudden flashes of wit which look like repartees and yet are not when they are examined more closely they are none the less delightful but they are to be classified under another head here is an example of the instantaneous quip which is not a true repartee felicitous as it is some years ago a friend of mr oliver herford's was going to europe on the celtic and the evening before his departure mr herford called him up on the telephone to say good-bye he asked what ship his friend was going on and some imp of the perverse prompted the friend to answer that he was sailing on the celtic mr herford promptly responded don't say that or you will have a hard sea all the way across we come a little closer to the genuine rejoinder and again without attaining it in a sharp turn attributed to voltaire that archwit was once speaking in praise of a certain contemporary man of letters and a bystander remarked that it was very good of m de voltaire to say pleasant things of this man since he was always saying unpleasant things of voltaire whereupon voltaire smiled sweetly and suggested perhaps we are both of us mistaken this may be accepted as a retort to an absent adversary 
it has the obvious element of self-defense which is ever the essential quality of the true repartee and it recalls the wise saying that it is the man who returns the first blow that begins the quarrel voltaire's rejoinder is characteristically neat it has the dexterity of the oriental executioner who seemed only to be flourishing his sword until he presented his snuff-box whereupon the victim promptly sneezed his amputated head from his unsuspecting shoulders it is in marked contrast to the surly brutality of dr johnson's verbal boxing after all the proper weapon for the accomplished master of fence is the delicate dueling sword and not the bludgeon or the boomerang even if these more vulgar instruments may also be wielded with deadly effect at bottom what gives to the true repartee its utmost effect is the fact that the engineer has been hoist by his own petard he is summarily disposed of while the rest of us are dazzled by the unforeseen sparks of the explosion speaker reed was once discussing the merits of president harrison with a fellow congressman who remembering that reed's well-known dislike of the president was heightened by the fact that in an appointment of a collector of the port of portland reed's candidate had been turned down in favor of the maine's senator said of course mr reed i know that mr harrison can't say no gracefully at which reed flashed out oh it's worse than that he can't say yes gracefully the mention of reed leads naturally to the mention of bismarck also a master of debate in his own lordly fashion in the days when the seven weeks war with austria was already looming in the distance a french minister at one of the german courts protested against prussia's conduct and warned bismarck that if it continued it would lead prussia straight to jena bismarck looked at the frenchman in the eye and asked the simple question why not to waterloo in like manner the mention of waterloo leads naturally to the mention of napoleon and talleyrand who were necessary to each other but who crossed swords often none the less when talleyrand was created prince of benevent he presented his wife to the emperor napoleon knew that the new princess resembled the heroine of the modern problem play in that she was a lady with a record whose career was rather checkered so he expressed his hope that her conduct in the future would be in accord with her exalted rank and talleyrand bowed and responded that madame de talleyrand would undoubtedly pattern her conduct on that of the empress he knew and he knew that napoleon knew that he knew how much scandal had attached to the conduct of josephine even after she had married napoleon in one of the bitter scenes of altercation which were not infrequent between napoleon and his indispensable minister the emperor declared that talleyrand probably expected to be chief of the regency if napoleon died but remember this threatened the irate sovereign if i fall dangerously ill you will be dead before me and talleyrand bowed ceremoniously and answered sire i did not need this warning to address to heaven my most ardent wishes for the conservation of your majesty's health on another occasion talleyrand heard a certain general talking contemptuously of a class of persons whom he designated as pekins talleyrand asked who were the creatures so curtly dismissed as unworthy of regard the general gladly explained that we soldiers call everyone a pekin who is not military and talleyrand accepted the explanation with his usual suavity i see he said it is just like what we do when we call anybody military who is not civil many of the best of talleyrand's good things are to be classed as true repartee but on occasion he was tempted by his readiness of wit to puncture pretenders even when he himself had not been attacked when a silly young fellow seated between madame de stal and madame recamier had the folly to insult both ladies by the remark that he was now between wit and beauty talleyrand could not resist the temptation yes he remarked and without possessing either at first glance this may look like an unprovoked assault and yet it may really be defended as a repartee since it was due to the desire to avenge a thoughtless slur on two ladies to whom he was greatly attached indeed madame de stal when she was most intimate with talleyrand was not a little jealous of madame recamier once she inquired of talleyrand which of them he would fish out of the water if she and madame recamier happened to fall in at the same time and again talleyrand was equal to this occasion with his most flattering smile he replied ah madame you swim so well two 
there is a charming subtlety about this which seems characteristically french yet we can now and again attain to an easy felicity that a frenchman might envy when the late maurice barrymore was once holding forth with his exuberant humor an intoxicated bystander rudely interrupted by crying out you're a liar barrymore was known to be a handy man with his fists and the spectators expected a swift blow from the shoulder it came only from the lips barrymore saw the man's condition and with a light laugh responded surely not if you say so this may be accepted as the repartee in all its nakedness in fact the repartee is almost always an ingenious variation of the everlasting retort you're another it is contained in its simplest form in the ancient and honorable dialogue which begins you're no gentleman and which ends you're no judge there is a variant of this which describes the fisticuffs of two rude fellows of the baser sort one of whom is heard to declare i'll learn you to behave like a gentleman whereat the other insists i defy you to do it and we may discover an analogy between these two masculine repartees and a feminine repartee credited to a british suffragette a puny male offensively thrust himself forward and interrupted the lady's eloquent address with the irrelevant query wouldn't you jolly well like to be a man and the champion of the fairer sex instantly proved its superiority by the counter question wouldn't you by the side of this intersexual retort may be placed several international repartees all credited to that anonymous but fascinating entity the american girl once when a beef-eater at the tower of london was displaying its treasures to a party of transatlantic pilgrims he drew special attention to a certain gun captured at the battle of bunker hill ladies and gentlemen and then the american girl rose to the occasion i see she said meekly you have the cannon and we have the hill this is perhaps a little sharper and less obvious than another of her retorts called forth by the remark of an english lady to the effect that she could see no reason why you americans seem to think so much of your own country then the american girl replied languidly i suppose it must be because we have seen some of the other countries closely akin to this is her swift response to another british dame who had read in the london papers horrible details about evil doings in the united states and who was thereby moved to suggest that if things did not improve it might be necessary to send over an army to chastise us whereupon the american girl affected surprised and asked what again when oscar wilde came to the united states to lecture on aesthetics in his highly aesthetic velvet costume and incidentally to prepare the public mind for the proper appreciation of gilbert and sullivan's patience in which the aesthetic movement was held up to ridicule he used to complain that america was very uninteresting since it had no antiquities and no curiosities but he ventured on this disparagement once too often for in the course of his travels he uttered it to the american girl and she replied with the demure depravity of candid innocence that this was not quite a fair reproach since we shall have the antiquities in time and we are already importing the curiosities lamb once declared that it was some compensation for growing old that in his youth he had seen the school for scandal acted by the incomparable cast that illuminated the original performance and perhaps the present writer may discover a like compensation in the fact that he can recall the elder southern's rich and mellow rendering of the crushed tragedian hazlitt writing it is true before the full flowering of the modern novel asserted that to read a good comedy is to keep the best company in the world where the best things are said and the most amusing happen yet even better than the reading of a good comedy entertaining as that may be is the recalling of its performance with the echo of its best things in our ears and with the memory of its amusing happenings rising unbidden before our eyes the crushed tragedian was not a very good comedy taken as a whole but southern's performance of the broken down old actor was a delight that no one who ever enjoyed it would willingly forget rising on the top wave of joyous recollection is the superb attitude of triumph assumed by southern as the old actor transfixes one of the other characters with what he believes to be a master stroke of repartee the other character is an old banker who when he learns that southern is an actor 
makes the lordly remark that it is twenty years since I have been in a theatre. This gives the crust tragedian his chance, and with immense scorn he hurls back the withering worlds, it is about the same time since I have been in a bank. This is transcendental in its sublimity. It is very much more felicitous than the more obvious rejoinder in one of Auger's comedies, in the course of which two friends discover that they have made a mistake. What fools we have been, one of them admits, and the other, a little nettled, replies, put that in the singular. Certainly, the first retorts, what a fool you have been. Obvious as this is, and inexpensive as it must be considered, it falls completely within the definition of the repartee. Not a few other examples might be picked from the pages of the younger Dumas and Beaumarchais, as well as from those of Sheridan and Congreve. Perhaps it is because actors are in the habit of taking part in the amusing happenings of good comedies, and of uttering the good things prepared for them by the authors, that they are encouraged to achieve good things of their own. During the run of The Blue Bird in New York last winter, a friend of the late Jacob Wundell, who played the part of the faithful dog in Matterlink's fairy allegory, met him at the players. This friend praised Wendell's performance of the canine character with the sole reservation of the barking. That, the volunteer critic insisted, was not so true to life as it should be. He declared finally, I could just naturally bark better than that myself. And Wendell gravely expostulated, Ah, but you see I had to learn my bark. 3. This may be taken as an example of the retort courteous, although it is not as gentle as one of Thackeray's. When the novelist made his single attempt to be elected to Parliament, he happened one day to meet the rival candidate, who parted from him with the familiar Anglo-Saxon phrase, May the best man win. To this Thackeray instantly responded, I hope not. Thackeray's collaborator in the pages of Punch, Douglas Gerald, was incapable of a suave rejoinder of this sort. Gerald was, in fact, a little like Dr. Johnson, in his disregard for the feelings of others, and in his willingness to give pain for the pleasure of his own wit. When Bensley, the publisher, told Gerald that he had at first intended to call his new magazine The Wit's Miscellany, but had finally decided to style it Bentley's Miscellany, Gerald smiled bitterly and said, Well, you needn't have gone to the other extreme. This is not a true repartee, since it was wholly gratuitous, being entirely without provocation. The sole justification for the bold retort is that it is a weapon of self-defense. Tennyson, so we are told, used to delight in narrating a rejoinder of a certain more or less disreputable man about town, named Trumpington, who was a crony of George the Fourth. Once when the king came down to a seaside resort, he met his friend with the remark, I hear you are the biggest blackguard in the place. And Trumpington bowed and responded, I hope your majesty has not come down here to take away my character. By the side of this may be put the remark of Ben Butler's during the Crédit Mobilier debate of 1873, perhaps not strictly a repartee by the definition insisted upon in these pages, and yet so near to the margin of the definition that it deserves mention here. Butler had objected to an elaborate and unduly distended speech of an opponent, who expostulated with the plea that he had expected to divide time with the honorable gentleman opposite. To this, Butler retorted, divide time? It looks to me more like dividing eternity. There is an epigram often attributed to Sheridan, but really composed by Lewis, the author of The Monk, which preserves in rhyme a repartee that may have been due originally to Sheridan himself. Lord Erskine, at woman presuming to rail, called a wife a tin canister tied to one's tail and fair lady anne while the subject he carries on seems hurt by his lordship's degrading comparison but wherefore degrading considered aright a canister's useful and polished and bright and should dirt its original purity hide that's the fault of the puppy to whom it is tied on one occasion at least sheridan and lewis sparred and the author of the school for scandal countered neatly on the author of the castle spectre this last piece was a tawdry melodrama which had proved very attractive at Drury Lane, although it had not brought to Lewis what he believed to be a proportionate share of its profits. 
by chance the manager and the author had a dispute about some question of the hour and lewis offered to back his opinion with a bet i'll make a big bet he cried i'll bet you what you have made by my play no retorted sheridan i'll make only a little bet i'll bet you what your play is really worth it is an interesting fact that sheridan prodigal as he was of wit in life as in literature was sparing of repartee or at least that his repartee was rarely or never offensive his humor was good humor also and that can rarely be said of a wit moore in his memorial poem declared that sheridan's wit ne'er carried a heart stain away on its blade sheridan was liked by those he laughed at he was that rare character a wit ready at repartee and yet not feared he was popular notwithstanding chesterfield's wise remark that to be known as a wit is a very unpopular denomination as it carries terror along with it and people in general are as much afraid of a live wit in company as a woman is of a gun which she thinks may go off of itself and do her a mischief if wit is a gun repartee is sometimes a gun that kicks and sorely bruises the shoulder of him who fires it a weapon of self-defense it may be but like other weapons it sometimes proves a dangerous possession perhaps a time may come when men will not be allowed to carry wit concealed about their persons without a special permit from the municipal authorities to be granted only to those who can bring testimonials to the gentleness of their character 1912 End of chapter 10